All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. And I got one other thing just before we get started here. I want to get up, and then we can really get going. Okay. There we go. Welcome, everybody. This is Joe Armstrong and the uh, February Power Systems Virtual User Group webinar. So um, today we've got a, a lot going on. I have one announcement before we get started, so I'm here just checking my notes here. Um, we're going to talk about security today, and so I'm going to give a little plug here for a little thing that IBM is doing um, right there, so you all should be able to see this now. This is a cybersecurity uh, kind of a presentation that IBM is going to do. It's uh, next week, week from today actually, March 3rd, and um, invite you all to go to this. There's, there's no charge. You register and attend this, um, hear about from some other presenters um, on, on cybersecurity, which is, as you know, kind of a big deal these days. So um, this flyer that I'm showing right now is out on the power systems. Uh, virtual user group wiki. Uh, there's a link to it out there kind of up in the, the header part of it. So go ahead and um, you know you can go this and go to this and register and um, attend this if you like because I think this would be also good material follow up from from today. All right. So today we're going to focus on uh, Power SC. This is not necessarily Power SC. This is talking a little bit about Power 10 and all the advantages that that you'll get with Power 10 on cybersecurity and and some other stuff as well. So um, just wanted to let you know about that. Um, with that, um, let's get into uh, today's topic, uh, Power SC, uh, Security and Compliance. What it stands for is um, software product that IBM has available uh, and all about how to make your, your system more secure and how to keep it secure as, as things change. You know, you have lots of systems, you're doing upgrades and this and that. And also about how to prove to auditors, which, you know, that's kind of a big deal for a lot of the people that, that have data centers and you have to get audits, um, that your systems are secure. So all important things, and that's our topic today. Um, the presentation materials for today are out on the wiki, and um, I have started the recording for this. I think I have to tell you that the recording is going. If you don't want to be recorded, you can drop now, and, um, and we'll get going with that. Um, I'll put a link to the recording on, um, if I don't get it today, it probably won't be until Monday uh, because I have a, a weekend that um, I have some things going on that I'll be gone tomorrow on the weekend. So um, let's go with, with our topic today. So Stephen Dominguez is, is a security uh, subject matter expert with IBM, one of the leading subject matter experts. He's worldwide um, um, AIX, Linux, OpenShift, Power Security. Um, lead for IBM Lab Services, um, so they do a lot of security, um, you know, things with for customers. He's worked for IBM for over 23 years. He's been a long time here, um, and delivering security stuff for the last 13. So Stephen's got a lot of history um, with the, with security. Um, he's provided cybersecurity consulting services to hundreds of customers um, on the United States and worldwide. Um, during his first 10 years with IBM, he worked in the Unix product test, um, served as a test lead for WebSM, HMC, um, AIX security, and that. He's a Java certified programmer, and um, you can visit um, his security blog at www.securitysteve.net. So that's pretty cool. Um, and maybe uh, Stephen will tell us a little bit about that. So um, let me just make sure I think I got everything. Um, Oh, one other, one other thing. Uh, as you know, if you've been here in the past, uh, the WebEx event has two kind of chat things. There's a Q&A pane and there's a chat pane. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A pane. That's kind of what we'll monitor for the questions. If you have chat comments and stuff, you know, do, do anything you want in the chat pane. Uh, but if you have actual questions for um, Stephen, that's kind of where we'll look is in the Q&A pane. So put them there. Um, with that, uh, Stephen, I uh, just need to make you the presenter. So let's do that. Okay, um, hand that over to you now, Stephen. Okay, thank you, Joe. I'll tell you when I can see your stuff up here. Okay. There, there it goes, looks good. Okay, great. 
Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, yeah, I'm Stephen, Domin Stephen Dominguez, and I'll be presenting today on Power SC 2.0. Uh, <clears throat> there's my email address if you'd like to contact me, and then also my security blog is securitysteve.net. And on that um, uh, blog, I, I have a lot of interesting um, pages on that. I have uh, uh, pages that discuss our services, our consulting services that I provide in IBM Lab Services, but I also have some links page. Uh, uh, so I have one uh, page called links, and basically whenever I've worked with customers and have to send a link, I, I actually uh, documented that link on my links page. So there's a lot of really interesting links related to AIX and Linux security on that page as well. Okay, so the objectives of this presentation is uh, we're gonna I'm gonna provide a, a overview of uh, Power SC, um, and uh, we're gonna survey a lot of the functionality. Uh, you know, I want to. Uh, present on a lot, but I can't really do everything. So I'm going to just kind of emphasize the, the more important elements of Power SE that really resonate with a lot of customers that a lot of customers uh, request um, uh, consulting assistance with and that uh, that I get a lot of questions about. Uh, so, but this will give you a really a broad uh, introduction to Power SE. And then a few of my comments will in order to understand how these uh, security features relate to cybersecurity in general, I kind of make some references to the CIS controls. Uh, CIS is an, is an organization, a Center for Internet Security organization that provides uh, universal cybersecurity recommendations for uh, companies of all sizes and types. And so sometimes it's interesting to know how these uh, security features relate to the cybersecurity in general. About me, I am the worldwide lead for AI and for AIX and Linux um, uh, security and also OpenShift and uh, IBM Lab Services. Uh, as Joe kind of mentioned, yeah, I've been, I've been for, um, working for IBM for 23 years. The last 13 years have been in IBM Lab Services. Uh, most of my uh, specialty is around AIX. Uh, most of my experience is around AIX, but the last few years I've been uh, actually learning more about Linux security. And then recently within the last year, I've been spending a lot of time with OpenShift. My hobbies are music, uh, NFL, and tennis. Okay, as a security consultant, basically, uh, I'm not a developer of AIX or Power SE, but what I do, I interface and talk to and communicate uh, and provide feedback about uh, our security functionality to AIX development and also to Rocket Software. Uh, Rocket Software is the de main developer of um, Power SC. And so, um, so I serve as kind of a technical, technical bridge between customers and also uh, development groups. My, my kind of thing, objective is, is uh, more really understanding these products very thoroughly by really uh, trying to master uh, and be extremely fluent in all the documentation provided by uh, a lot of the security features that I work with. Okay, so the agenda for today is the first section we're going to spend a lot of time is just getting an overview of Power SE 2.0. Uh, and then after we uh, take a look at that section, then I'm going to focus on three uh, areas. Um, uh, the uh, one is the AIX Trusted Execution Tool, which is very important for protecting uh, against malware on AIX. And then also I'll spend some time uh, and uh, with a slight greater emphasis on patching for AIX and VIOS using the Power SE component called Trusted Network Connect and Patch Management. And then last but not least is I'm going to talk about endpoint detection and response on Power SC. Uh, so there has been a, a, sh a new adoption of actually um, uh, making a Power SE in addition to what it's done in the past, it's now also serving as an EDR platform. And that's a really uh, very significant uh, addition to PowerSE functionality. And so we'll take a look at that. And that's actually something that has been an, a, a, a big change in the recent levels of PowerSE. This is a new feature of PowerSE, it becoming a EDR platform. Okay, so as far as the history of Power SC, you know, Power SC actually started uh, way back in 2011 in AIX development. It was actually uh, released. Power SC was released uh, in uh, 2011 by AIX uh, development. And then uh, AIX development worked with it for a, a few years. But then in 2016, 
Rocket Software became the PowerSC development partner with IBM. And so right now, uh, since 2016, uh, really, Rocket Software is working, has been working in partnership with IBM, but they're doing uh, really most of all the programming and um, development around PowerSC, but, but it's done in cooperation with IBM. Um, and so uh, basically every year uh, after 2016, usually the fall release has a major release of new functionality. And then uh, also what's really significant is that last September, um, there was the release 2.000, and that's uh, a, a big change in that now the PowerC 2.0 uh, actually has two products. It has what's called the Standard Edition PowerSC product, and then also the uh, PowerSC MFA product. So both of those major products and all of their subcomponents, all of it is now merged under PowerSC 2.0. Okay, so as you see, this uh, diagram kind of illustrates that. And then on the left, uh, under PowerSC 2.0, we have standard edition. And uh, the main kind of components under that are uh, basically a GUI server and agents. Uh, so when you use PowerSC uh, GUI server and its agents, which is basically providing centralized management, uh, that's under standard edition. We also have security and compliance automation. Uh, so those are all the kind of the features listed there on the left. And then the other thing to understand is that <clears throat> um, multi-factor authentic authentication actually has a different server, okay? So there's a, a GUI server that does the centralized compliance and the EDR functionality and a lot of the security functions and compliance functions. However, there's a completely different server that you, is set up and has basically MFA clients. And that's what's done for the multi-factor authentication product for uh, PowerSE. And so here's uh, the standard edition uh, components, uh, a quick uh, description of each of them. Uh, I already discussed the GUI, the security and compliance automation components. That is the security hardening component, uh, okay, where we're uh, hardening the system. We'll take a look at that uh, uh, shortly, a little bit more. Real-time compliance is an AIX uh, file integrity uh, management uh, um, tool but it also actually uh, monitors the compliance of the system. And we'll take a little bit more look at that later. TNC is what provides AIX and BIOS updates. Uh, and then trusted logging provides um, centralized logging over the hypervisor using BSCSI. Um, trusted boot is a way to verify boot integrity. And then the trusted firewall is a way, it's, it's not a, a general purpose firewall. What it is really is a packet filter that allows you to filter packets on the same frame uh, from partition, uh, partitions that are on different VLANs. And then uh, some newer components that were released is the file access policy daemon, and that does what's called allow listing, and we'll talk about allow listing later more, and, and that's done for RHEL. And then a newer component as well that provides intrusion detection is this uh, port scan uh, attack detector, and that's on RHEL as well. So as far as requirements, you know, when you're doing the uh, centralized management of compliance and security settings, you're going to use the GUI uh, server and the GUI agent. And so that does, a, that does have a Java 8 requirement as listed. And then these are the uh, different uh, requirements for the agent. So the agent is your, is your basic uh, partition VM that you're protecting, right? The server is the centralized server, but these agents are going to be uh, installed on all your systems. Uh, that are going to be managed by the GUI server, and so the uh, uh, you know the uh, requirements are listed there, and the agents are basically going to be your AIX, VIOS, uh, Linux on Power, SLES, and RHEL, and then also System I, IBM I. Okay, so what is PowerSC not? Okay, so it's not a SIM such as Q Radar or Splunk. It is not also traditional endpoint malware detection and prevention software. Uh, so, and what that is, this traditional endpoint uh, prevention software for viruses and malware, that's basically a, a tool that maintains a database of known signatures of, of um, malicious software. And uh, a tr traditional uh, solution would compare the files on your uh, file systems to see if any of those files, the, the signatures of those files, uh, actually map up to a known signature of known malware. And so PowerSC does not do that, okay? Um, 
Paris also, Piracy does not provide HMC security currently. However, that could change. And that's why I put a, a TBD. Uh, so in the future, it's possible that Power SE will release some functionality for uh, uh, providing some security controls for HMC. Uh, it does not really involve itself with data encryption. And then last, it does not involve itself with uh, centralized user and group management, uh, such as uh, you know protocols such as LDAP and Kerberos. Okay, so this next subject, subject subsection is going to be we're going to take a closer look at the graphical user interface. So why is this important? So the CIS organization, and that once again, that's the Center for Internet Security. It's a nonprofit uh, organization that has hundreds of cybersecurity professionals that volunteer to provide guidance to companies of all types and all sizes throughout the world. And they provide a, a, um, a specification called the CIS controls. And they're basically like, basically like a couple of hundred of universal cybersecurity recommendations that they uh, promote. And what they say is that you should securely manage enterprise assets and software. And so the uh, PowerSC is, is uh, very well designed to do that. Uh, the solution itself is a PCI compliant solution. So it's a highly secure uh, uh, tool for securing your power endpoints systems. And as you see those three dots on the right, those are implementation groups. And what that means is that the Center for Interstate Internet security is, is recommending organizations of type uh, implementation group one, two, and three should all be doing this. Like you should all be using securely manage, uh, managing your enterprise assets, uh, using secure tooling. And uh, so that's uh, recommended for everyone, every type of, whether you're a small business up to a large corporation. Okay. So uh, the thing about the GUI, the thing to understand is when, when uh, in 2011, when uh, Power SE was originally released, what it was was a set of tools that were individual standalone tools that you installed on your VMs, but they were independent of each other and they did not communicate or really uh, cooperate really with each other too much. They were just simply separate tools. And, sent, and so when that was released, you know, uh, you know, IBM got a lot of recommendations to provide a, a centralized GUI interface so that you could manage all the tooling on, on multiple endpoints from one system, right? And so uh, that's where actually Rocket Software came in in 2016. And they actually had a lot of expertise with a GUI based uh, code and they had their own libraries. And, and uh, that's actually where they, they uh, the first major thing that they did for PowerSE is provide a graphical user based uh, management uh, console. And so, uh, so basically, uh, there's a, a transformation that occurred uh, through the Power SE GUI in such that it's basically bringing all these tools together, together, all these tools together. And you can think of it as a tool belt that is basically, you know, putting all your tools together and connecting them. So this next diagram is a topology diagram of Power SE. Uh, and the, is more specifically the GUI and the agents. And basically what you have here is that you have the GUI server and it's basically has an agent, it's a HTTPS server, and it's connecting to various types of endpoints, right? So you have your SLES or RHEL, Linux on power endpoint, you have AIX or VIOS, and then IBM I endpoints. And so on the endpoints, you're running a, another daemon. There's a daemon that runs, it's, that's called the UI agent. And the UI agent is gonna basically interface or talk to uh, tooling, uh, different tools that run on the endpoint system. And so, um, uh, and so that's how it uh, promotes the communication and the centralized management is by basically the UI server talking to these UI agents that are run, running on those VMs. And then uh, along this topology also kind of provided uh, another thing I'm showing is that there's a TNC. If you're doing AIX or VIOS patching, uh, there's this TNC component that has a TNC server and a TNC PM. And so those can also be used for centralized patching. And uh, those components, those servers, uh, one in particular, the TNC PM component is talking to the uh, internet and it's talking to IBM ECC and, and Central. And so that's the only component that uh, uh, interfaces, uh, communicates with the internet. All these other um, uh, portions do not contact the internet. And if you're not uh, interested in using the patching component, then you would, have, you would not need a, uh, uh, you know, either a firewall exception or you would not 
either need to use a, a HTTPS proxy. Okay, so what are the, the main features of the GUI? So the main features is the security and compliance automation. So that's hardening. The other is endpoint detection and response. Very, some wonderful uh, functionality was released. And so the EDR uh, functionality is a great part of GUI, the GUI. You also have what's called file integrity monitoring, which allows you to monitor um, basically AIX and, uh, and Linux files um, on, on the VMs. And it also has some, um, uh, monitoring of I as well. Uh, the other thing that it provides is AIX and VMS patching via TNC. Uh, allow listening is another thing it, it actually provides for um, RHEL and also AIX. Intrusion detection is also provided for um, AIX and RHEL um, and to a certain extent IBMI. Also, another main feature about the GUI is that it has uh, uh, really a lot of good options for reporting, and we'll take a look at that later. And then last is the uh, automation. So if you want to automate functions, uh, you can do that with a, a Power SC GUI REST API. So what do you, what do, you do on the GUI? Uh, so uh, uh, one of the things you do is you deploy your security settings to endpoint systems using the security and compliance automation feature. That allows you to deploy settings, allows you to check settings, and also undo settings on the endpoint systems. Um, within the GUI also is that you can organize your partitions into groups. And so there, you can do this manually, but there's also a thing in PowerSC that provides a dynamic grouping of partitions in which you specify rules and the GUI itself actually will map and group partitions according to the criteria that you specify in the dynamic rules. You can also do what's called separation of duties and via admin control. And what that means is that, you know, you can log on to the GUI and an admin can, for example, have access to all partitions to manage them and he can see all partitions. But if you if you want to promote separation of duties, uh, what you do is uh, you can basically limit like what persons have what access to which systems, right? So you have security administrative access control and you, that can be configured. Um, also, the security profiles that you deploy, there's a great uh, uh, profile editor that you can use to customize the settings. So if you want to uh, mix settings from different profiles, if you want to remove settings, um, you have complete flexibility in doing that. You can even import um, um, uh, XML-based profiles uh, if you've created them yourself, uh, which is a rare thing, but it is actually technically possible. You can import XMLs uh, for application and use with the uh, uh, security and compliance uh, functionality. So this tool is also very scalable from you know simple environments to extremely complex environments. It scales excellently, the uh, PowerSC GUI. Um, and basically, it's providing centralized management of all your tooling. Uh, and then, all, as I said, it's prov it provides extensive reporting options. This is an example of what the GUI looks like. And so in, in this uh, page, we see the compliance page. And there are uh, basically four VMs that are being uh, monitored. Uh, there's a dashboard that is part of the GUI in which basically just provides an overall view of the entire environment. So it's a summary or snapshot of the entire environment. Uh, this is a, a snapshot of the uh, group editors where you can basically define different groups. And so a, a partition, a VM can map to um, several groups, you know, so there's no limitation on how you define groups. It's very flexible. The scalability is excellent. You should see excellent performance when you're managing up to 500 endpoints. And then you, uh, you can even go beyond like a thousand endpoints. The only thing you, you want to do in, in order to maintain uh, performance is that when you, when you click on a group, you don't want uh, the group to be more than 500 endpoints, okay? So if you have a large group with let's say a thousand or 1500 endpoints, that's where you might see some uh, performance lag. Okay, but the way to uh, work around that is simply, you know, don't maintain that type of size of groups. Just have smaller groups. Uh, multi you can have multiple smaller groups. Um, okay. Okay, this next section, we're going to take a closer look at the security and compliance automation portion of Power SE. 
And this is the feature that provides security hardening. So these are the security controls, the CIS controls. You know, what is the significance of the security compliance automation? Well, these are several controls that are recommended by the Center for Internet Security. And they're saying, you know, main, establish and maintain a secure configuration process, configure automatic session locking on enterprise assets. And that's what the, uh, the uh, security and compliance automation would do. And the tool behind that is PSC Expert. So the tool behind all of this compliance and security hardening is called PSC Expert. Um, you know, the Center for Intersex Security says you should manage default accounts on enterprise assets and software. And so that's it, that's what's done in the security hardening. And then once again, another thing that's done that's recommended by CIS is the uninstall and disablement of unnecessary services on enterprise assets. And as you see, see the, the dots, uh, the three dots means all organizations from small businesses to large organizations should be doing it. And, but on the bottom, you see two dots, and that means IG level two and three. And that's basically any kind of company that's uh, uh, IG2, a simplistic definition is, is a medium to large size company um, with security, uh, you know, um, they're trying to prevent a breach. Uh, and also a, a level three is a very high security organization. Um, and I would say pretty much like I've worked with hundreds of power customers and I personally have really never interacted with the IG level one. A power customer. An IG level one customer would be like a small business using power. And I, I haven't really encountered that. And so really pretty much most customers uh, are going to be IG level two. And then I would say a small percentage of power customers are IG level three, which is extremely high security. And, and then I would say also some customers are between two and three in which they're maybe mainly a IG level two customer, but there's certain things in the IG3 tier that should be done by the power customer. Um, so anyway, so security and compliance automation, uh, what is that? That's the tool for security hardening. Uh, you harden your system according, a sec to, uh, according to a security uh, type that's represented by an XML file. So uh, these security hardening uh, uh, profiles are changing numerous types of different settings. Hundreds of settings can be changed. Um, and so the good thing about the uh, Power SC uh, functionality, you can customize this and uh, to however you want. And this tooling, once again, allows you to apply, check, and undo settings. So the the tool behind this is PSC Expert. Uh, so this is a, a basically and originally a started as a binary binary command that you run on uh, AIX. This is what does the hardening. It's basically reading an XML file. The XML file will instruct it uh, as to what scripts to run locally and also what arguments sh that should be sent into those scripts. Okay, but this is what uh, what's also ported to the other operating systems. This is PSC expert uh, command. Okay, so these are the there's different types of XML files that are distributed by Power SE. So these are the different types. Um, the first of all is just the AIX XMLs that Rocket Software has published themselves. They create these um, XMLs. And so uh, basically those are the ones listed there. The first one, the CIS V1 is a, in general, I would recommend that to uh, customers in the general case, like if they're looking for something and, and there's no specific requirement. However, you could have a power customer that has DOD requirements or maybe they have uh, GDPR compliance that they're trying to meet, or they could be a PCI or NERC. A compliance type of customers. And so what you can, this tool allows you to deploy a compliance profile that is uh, uh, basically corresponds to your organization and what's needed. And once again, you can also mix and match uh, security uh, settings and uh, security controls between these different profiles. So you can have a heterogeneous type of profile if you want as well. These were the uh, XMLs that were distributed prior to Rocket Software. Um, you know, uh, becoming a, a development partner with IBM on Power SE. And so these are older ones. Uh, in general, you know, you can use them, but I would steer more towards the newer ones, uh, especially that CIS uh, XML. Uh, there's also uh, basically a levels of PSC Expert that what I call are built in. Uh, so you don't find a, like, for example, a low.xml or a medium.xml, right? But you can, if you uh, issue a command, the, the system will understand. And this is really old, much older functionality. Uh, it, you can use it to harden your system, but once again, I would actually steer more towards the uh, the newer XMLs, such as the 
CIS as XML. Now, this is actually a really good uh, XML for VIOS. So, so for VIOS, you want to be using one of these uh, two XMLs, and they are specifically tested against VIOS. And so for VIOS, I would use one of these if you're going to harden your VIOS. Uh, these are the uh, Linux uh, XMLs provided. So the CIS Linux is probably a good one in general to use, but you, there's some other options there listed. And then for IBM, IBM I, there is one XML listed. Well, Stephen, okay. for the Linux ones, what versions of Linux? Is it just RHEL or RHEL, SUSE, Ubuntu? What, what, what can they be used for? Uh, so it's, uh, I have, I think it's RHEL 7 and SLES 12. I have that on another slide. Okay, okay, good. All right, thanks. It is a higher level of RHEL, right? So this is, these are higher levels. Um, uh, so RHEL 7 and, uh, yes, yeah, less, um, uh, I have that on another slide. Okay, good, good. Um, okay, so with the PSE expert command, you can, um, uh, you can also generate a compliance report, and this is what it looks like, and, and the GUI will actually use the, this function to create CSV uh, formatted files. Uh, this is an example, like if once you're security hardening your systems, if if, a, if somebody goes onto the system and changes a setting, the idea is that this the compliance profile will detect that. And this is an example of what an error would look like. So, for example, what it says here is that the attribute is zero, the min length value, but it should be seven. And so it has detected that, and you see that in the GUI. And then also, depending upon how you configure the EDR platform, on, underneath this um, running on top of PowerSC, you could actually get an email as well about this um, event. Okay, this next feature is very important. It's called a compatibility check. Um, and it's also called simulation. Also, that's an, it's also re referred to as a simulation. Okay, so this is a really interesting feature of PowerSC. And what it does, because of the PowerSC expert command, what it, it can do is basically uh, uh, check a profile, like let's say you have the CIS profile, your profile and you're interested to apply to a system. What you can do is simulate that profile against the VM. And what that means is that you're basically gonna find out, it, let's say the, the, C, the CIS profile has 100 security settings, right? You're gonna find out on your running system how many of those settings are already compliant on the running system. Okay, and it checks this without altering the running system. Uh, so this is very important because by doing this compatibility check, uh, let's say you run the compatibility check and let's say that only 25 of those 100 settings are implemented on the endpoint. That means that there's 75 settings that when you apply that profile, there's 75 settings that are gonna change, right? And, uh, so that's a very important thing because actually what, one of the things I recommend is that you have to be careful with changing settings on your operating system, right? Because that could affect users, it could affect applications. And this simulation feature allows you to, before you change anything on the system, to detect what's gonna change. And then what I recommend to customers is that what you wanna do is actually, um, um, you want to actually review and vet and to, uh, research those settings that are going to change because you, you you don't want to you want to ensure that when you apply the settings that um, that uh, you, you're not going to break an application you're not going to create problems right and so this simulation feature allows you to detect what is going to change uh, at a fundamental level on the system when you deploy the profile and then you know I provide services within that we actually help customers. Uh, create XMLs that are fully compatible to your systems. Uh, but this, this simulation feature is actually a very important feature for trying to integrate these security settings on your VMs, okay? So that's a really great feature that is very popular with customers. Okay, this is the profile editor. And this is, there's another part of the GUI where you can take an XML and, and uh, basically modify it and create your own. Uh, version and so this kind of shows it in which what I'm doing I'm taking a PCI XML and then I'm on the right hand side I'm basically basically selecting settings and then transporting it them to a custom XML that I'm creating on the right hand side. 
very uh, user friendly, very, um, very easy to use. Okay, so the next aspect that I'm going to be uh, talking about is uh, file integrity monitoring. And so, um, and so this is another aspect that uh, 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 PowerSC provides. And, uh, and why is this important? So one of the reasons why this is important is because the CIS recommends for, uh, you know, IG level two and IG level three organizations, which is really most power customers, that you should deploy host-based intrusion detection uh, solution. And so uh, that's basically uh, what the FIM can do in uh, promoting uh, your cybersecurity. So as far as FIM options, uh, so natively PowerSC provides native FIM uh, with the PowerSC real-time compliance component. Um, and then for Linux, uh, basically what happens is Audit D provides that uh, FIM functionality. And what PowerSE does is basically have an, it has an interface so it can communicate with Audit D. And then lastly, for IBM I, uh, uh, FIM is provided via the IBM I audit journal. And so what PowerSE GUI is doing is simply uh, in, uh, providing an interface to so it can talk to the IBM I audit journal. Okay, so why is RTC, you know, such a significant tool? Um, so RTC is unique. It's native to AIX, and you really don't have this on Linux, uh, this particular solution. It's a very, uh, it's a great uh, feature. It's uh, uh, one of the most popular features, uh, um, uh, you know, with customers. Very easy to deploy, implement. Uh, it is not invasive. It does not, you know, uh, hardly, uh, very easy to adopt and integrate into your environments. Um, and so the way it works is that it has a special kernel extension called the AHA FS kernel extension, kernel extension, which stands for the Autonomic Health Advisory File System. And this is uh, basically what happens. This is a kernel extension that it basically monitors 300 critical security files. And so anytime, uh, you know, like one of these critical files, when either a access change occurs on one of these critical security files, or uh, if uh, content or access changes on one of these critical files, the RTC kernel extension immediately detects that and it sends a message to a daemon running on AIX called the RTCD daemon. All this is done instantaneously. And then also, also from a CPU perspective, it's very efficient because you only expend CPU cycles with this kernel extension when one of those specific 300 files is altered with access or content, otherwise no CPU uh, cycles are spent. So it, in general, it's considered a highly efficient uh, solution. This is an event flow of an RTC event. And so, so for example, what we see here is that um, you have the AHA FX uh, kernel extension, and we have Etsy hosts that's being monitored by that kernel extension. And, the, and there, of course, there's other files, as I said, there's 300, around 300 by default. And so what happens is if somebody changes the access or content to Etsy hosts, the AHA FS uh, kernel extension will receive that uh, event, and then it sends a message to the daemon running on AIX called RCD, RTCD daemon. And then when, when that occurs, uh, uh, an automated check, the PSC expert command essentially runs a check of your compliance settings, okay? And if there are, if that change in that file resulted in a compliance failure, then that all of that information is collected together and reported via email at, and or logging. Uh, so, um, so all of that event information is captured. And uh, one thing that is really um, brilliant about this tool that's unique is that those 300 files were actually determined by AIX development years ago. They analyzed all of their AIX code to ask the question, when we secure our code in AIX development, what are all the files that get altered? And in that analysis, they determined that there's a, a particular set, 300 files that the security tooling of AIX, uh, it basically is gonna alter one of these 300 files in order to secure the system. And so that essentially identified the 300 most critical, uh, fundamentally uh, critical security files on the operating system. So I thought that was a very brilliant type of, type of methodology that AIX development used to determine those 300 files. Okay, so you get event messages, and this is what you would see, like if there was an event on, on a file, this is what you would see at the GUI. And so you're, you know, you basically get the name of the file, what's the PID, what's the host name. What I like also, if you look at that user info, info uh, row, is that 
the username is root, but the login name is sdomain. So what that means is that this file was modified by a person who logged in as sdomain, but then they actually changed it using root privileges. So uh, that's uh, some good security forensic information that's provided via this tool. Uh, and then via the GUI, you know, so when the, one of the philosophies is with PowerSC GUI is that we don't want customers to have to log in to all your separate partitions to manage your security endpoints. We want to simplify things, make things easier. And so like, for example, RTC, you can do a lot of the RTC configuration uh, through simply through the GUI. Okay, so and that's such things as configure the, the RTC daemon. There's different options. You can edit like what files are being monitored. You can customize that as however you wish. Uh, and then also once you have a, a, a feature deployed the way you want for a particular VM, you can copy that configuration to any to any other group of systems. And so that's a common theme with a lot of the PowerSC functionality is that once you define your settings of a particular component for one system, you usually can copy that configuration to a whatever group you specify. And that saves on administration time. Okay, uh, so anyway, these are the monitoring details of RTC. And basically, um, the thing to understand is that there's two types of monitoring. You can either specify monitoring of access. So if somebody changed access to a file via file permissions or ownership, file ownership, that gets detected. Or you can monitor content change. So when the file changes, then a, a security event would be generated. And so uh, you can do either. And the one thing about a common question is, uh, if there's a file change, does it tell you the delta? And no, the, the tool does not tell you, if there is a file change, it does not tell you the delta or the change that occurred. It just, you just get a notification that the file changed. And um, uh, and also what, of course, anytime one of these security events occurs, a Power SE expert check is run against your compliance setting, compliance settings to make sure that that change of the file did not impact your security settings. Okay, this next section is going to take a closer focus into the reports uh, portion of the GUI. So uh, there's actually a tab for reports, and there's different types of uh, compliance uh, reports that you can create. Uh, you can create compliance tabs, FIM, uh, 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 file integrity reports. There's also, you can combine those things as well. There's also a, um, when, when you define these reports, you can have these uh, reports sent out to you via email and you can specify, you know, a subject heading and, and time of day that you want these reports sent to you. You can get a uh, CSV uh, uh, formatted file that provides all the details of uh, the security compliance checks that are occurring on the system. There's also a new interactive timeline report in which you can basically uh, click on a partition and view the major events that occurred, like, for example, okay, on Monday, you know, uh, uh, the CIS XML was deployed. On Wednesday, somebody unapplied uh, maybe the CIS XML. On Thursday, TNC did an update operation on the partition. So you can have a timeline report as well. And then uh, later, we're going to talk about a new report, event analysis report, that's part of EDR. And, but we'll take a look, closer look into that later. Okay, this next section is going to uh, basically part of the PowerSC overview is that we're going to take a quick look at multi-factor authentication. And so um, the Center for Internet Security says that basically for all types of organizations, right, so one to three, every type of organization uh, business should require multi-factor authentication for remote network access. Uh, it, they also say that if a person has, let's say somebody is, is uh, local, they're not remote, right? But if they're going to be activating uh, administrative access, that anytime you activate administrative access, uh, and that would be either locally or remote, that multi-factor authentication should be used. Okay, so that's a very powerful statement. And it's, and it's really, uh, this is a big deal. Uh, uh, but the reason why they make such a big deal about this is because multi-factor authentication, when properly implemented, is a very powerful defense against intrusion and security breaches. There's numerous case studies that indicate, you know, this, uh, you know that a lot of breaches might have not occurred if multi-factor authentication was used. Uh, so it's a very important uh, 
security defense recommended really for all types of organizations. So Power SC MFA is very flexible on how it implements multi-factor authentication. And so the idea with multi-factor authentication is, is that we want to get away from, in order to access a system, like for, S for example, SSH system, we don't just want to submit a username and password and no other form of authentication occurs. That's, that is not multi-factor authentication. So we want to use multiple factors in, in order to gain access to a system or to some type of resource. And so these are, what I've listed here is all the different authentication methods that can be used and configured with Power SE 2.0. And you have great flexibility on how you define your authentication method configuration. Okay. Uh, just for time purposes, I'll continue. What I've listed here is also the minimum requirements for the PMFA client and also the PMFA server. And so um, um, the PMFA, you're going to have, when you implement uh, PMFA, basically uh, you implement the PMFA server uh, that is one main server that you would point all of your clients to. Um, and then the clients are going to run on, on the individual systems that you're granting access to, right? And so that could be AIX, VIOS, HMC. So HMC actually has... This solution is, is a PAM module-based solution, and actually, uh, HMC actually integrates the PAM module needed, so you don't have to install anything on HMC. The HMC basically natively supports PowerSE 2.0, uh, even virtual HMC. Uh, so these are all the different levels uh, for this solution. Okay, this next section I want to discuss briefly is licensing, how to obtain licensing for PowerSE. Uh, you know, IBM, this uh, PowerSC is an official IBM solution, and so the licensing is essentially based on a per-core basis. Uh, so the good thing is that if you get licensed uh, for PowerSC 2.0, you get everything, the standard edition and MFA. Uh, standalone licensing is, you know, that's the least expensive route to uh, purchase a licensing. However, it's not necessarily the best value. Because if you pay a little bit more for the bundles, for the licensing bundles, uh, if you like those other software uh, tools that are in the, in the licensing bundles, you would actually could get a better value by uh, using one of the bundles. And I have a, a diagram that shows that uh, shortly. Um, and so the idea is once you get properly licensed for PowerSC, um, basically a customer would be able to log in to entitled system support and be able to download uh, the licensing. And so if you, uh, if you have a customer interested in obtaining licensing, uh, the business partner or IBM seller should work with the customer to obtain the proper licensing. This is a matrix that basically lists all the different, uh, you know, operating systems. You got Linux on Power AX and IBM I and whether or not a particular licensing, um, you know, provides licensing to that uh, operating system. Okay, there's also a 90-day trial that can be used to evaluate. This is an evaluation-only trial in which you can't really use it for any kind of production systems whatsoever or for your business. It's simply a, a, a trial license, so you can set up some uh, test partitions and, you know, just experiment with PowerC, evaluate and see if you like it. And then, so that's also possible. Uh, uh, um, you know, you can extend that 90 days if you really need more time. And then if a customer is interested, they need to work with their IBM seller and business partner. The business partner or seller really manages that and uh, really leads that effort uh, behind the trial license. Okay, so uh, we've completed the overview of PowerC 2.0. And so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to focus now on... Um, on the AIX Trusted Execution Tool. So I'm going to kind of highlight uh, some details about this tool. A lot of times I get questions about this tool, and so I like to go over it. So why is this tool important uh, in for cybersecurity reasons? And the reason why is because it, it does what's called allow listing, okay? Allow listing is a concept of basically you define what um, executables are allowed to execute on your partition is very important. It's a very powerful security defense. Um, now, if you look at the CIS controls, one of the things they say, um, they, they're basically saying authorized software and libraries should be uh, allow listed and by CIS implementation group two and three customers. So that's really most power customers should be doing this. Uh, if you, it, how it, That's how it correlates to power customers. And then this, the third recommendation is, 
allow list authorized scripts, allow list. And with that, they want you to basically implement allow listing with scripts. Now, what you see there is only one dot and that's IG3 dot. And what they're saying there that this is more of a, um, to do, to implement this uh, would require a lot more effort to maintain. Cause basically what you're doing is you're defining a list of authorized executables, but you have to, the, the challenge is to determine what needs to be allow listed and also within this uh, description of allow list, if a executable of a script in this case is not allow listed, then it does not execute. And so that's a big, uh, that could be a, a big problem with, uh, you know, with a business, right? If something is trying to execute and it is not allowed. And so that's why it's marked as level three, because it's, it's a very powerful cybersecurity recommendation, but it's not easily implementable. And so, for example, small businesses would never do it, right? And even some medium, medium sized to large businesses, it's maybe not impractical for them to try to achieve this type of cybersecurity defense. Um, however, the good thing is trust execution actually allows you to implement a different form of allow listing that actually makes this much easier that I'll discuss shortly. Now, the other thing I wanna point it out is that these CIS controls are two, like 2.5, 2.6. There's actually uh, 18 um, uh, levels. And so the second level means it's actually very high. So this is actually a very high cybersecurity uh, prioritized uh, recommendation. Okay, so why TE? Why is this so important? Uh, trust execution in, uh, addresses the integrity of the AIX system. Uh, it helps you answer the question, how can you trust what's running on your system? How do you not know that what's, you know, especially if you've been hacked, if there's been a security breach, how do you know what software has been, has been altered? Okay. And this is a big deal. There was a major breach that occurred last year with an organization, a company. And after the breach, one of the things that they addressed it addressed in the company is that they actually have a, a mirror of their production environment in which the mirror has uh, almost no access. But the, the reason why they maintain a mirror of their production environment is because they need in the future, they want to know that, you know, how can you compare against a reference? They want to know if certain things are um, are altered, they want a reference point, right? And so they maintain their production, but they mirror it with a secure mirrored environment that's that's not very accessible, that is high security, but all it is there for is to reference, to compare their production against this uh, secured mirror so that if they want to determine if something is altered, they can compare against that secure mirror. So that's all of that is integrity and that's what TE is all about. How do you trust what's running on your system? Uh, it's based upon a concept of a trusted file. And what that is, is that you, you basically have a file and you register, register it to a database called the Trusted Signature Database. And this allows you to verify that a file is authentic and correct. By default, the database lists actually 3,000 files that are provided by AIX operating system that are listed in the database just out of the box. So you're able to verify the integrity of 3,000 files right off the bat. And then you can, of course, you can modify this database to include other files that you want to be verified for security correctness. So how do you uh, promote the integrity of the system? So we're basically, we're able to use this database to verify the correctness of files that um, they have the proper file permissions that they have been altered. You know, uh, there's various checks that we can do. Uh, we also can promote integ integrity by limiting what executables run based upon what location they, res what directory they reside in, okay? So that's called a, a trusted execution path function. I'll talk about that shortly. We can also verify RBAC commands to make sure that they're, if you're, if you're using RBAC, we can make sure that they're not hacked. Those, uh, the definition of those, those commands are not hacked. You can verify directory permissions, uh, you know, uh, you can detect a lot of things simply by watching syslog. So TE records messages to syslog. syslog. It's basically a uh, security defense for AIX uh, that uh, is a defense against Trojan horses, viruses, rootkits, okay, and allows you to scan for malware as well. And what I mean by that in that case is we're just looking for, it's not, um, I would say, unregistered set UID, set GID, uh, set GID files, okay. Uh, 
I get a question. So what, how does this tool compare to traditional endpoint uh, virus protection? You know, should you get both? Should you get one? Uh, you know, I, I get this question a lot. And so basically what I recommend is that you actually, this is a good thing to do. This is an allow listing. Essentially it's an allow listing solution. It is a defense against malware. Okay. But it is still good to run a local, um, traditional malware detection solution on your AIX systems, that's actually a different CIS control. They recommend traditional uh, uh, malware should be used on pretty much most types of enterprises. And so the uh, a common one used on AIX is help systems, has a traditional antivirus, anti-malware solution. And if, if you want to you know, have better security on your AIX systems, you should also do that in addition to trust execution. Okay, so there are two modes of operation for uh, trust execution. There's a system mode, which is basically a manual mode in, in which you, you run a, use the trusted check command, which is the TE command, and you run it manually at the command line, or you can put it in a cron tab job. And then there's another mode in which it's the runtime mode. And this is a type of checking and security enforcement that's done by the AIX kernel. Very powerful. And, and, and actually really implements the allow listing functionality that is so desired. Okay, uh, so one important aspect of TE is the TSD, and that's the database that houses all of the files that are being verified and authenticated. Um, it's just basically a flat file, a flat uh, ASCII a file, a stanza-based Unix file under Etsy Security TSD, TSD.dat. This is what it looks like. Uh, so basically what we have here is uh, the shutdown command. And as you see, there's different attributes that are listed there, like the owner, what's the group supposed to be, what's the file permission supposed to be. And then the other thing that you have here is cryptographic checking values, such as the signature and the hash value. And these values are created and provided you, to you by IBM. But when you run a check against this file, it, it basically allows you to verify that the shutdown command that you are using is indeed the one published by IBM. Okay, so that's that digital signature uh, feature is very important for integrity checking. Okay, so one of the modes that I discussed is the system mode. This is the manual mode. And basically with, with this mode, you can check a single file or you can check all of, all of the files in the database. Um, and there's three basic options when you do a system check. You can basically run a dash N option, which is to just check and, and, and just tell me errors and don't do anything else. Dash T is to prompt the user to request. If it does find an error, should I fix the error? And then dash Y is where you run the check and you and you tell the tool fix all errors that you find. Now, one kind of caveat to be careful is sometimes there's a severe error, and that's a case where you run a check on a file and there's a cryptographic failure. And when that happens, trusted execution interprets that to mean that, hey, this file is not the correct file. This could be malware. And so if you correct a severe error, it'll make that file inaccessible. So that's something to be careful of. And remember, this is a malware prevention tool. So that's why it would make, if you have a cryptographic error, it's not maintaining a database of files that are correct. It, it just it just checks that checksum. And if it's not right, it considers that file to be potentially a malware uh, software. Okay, so the runtime mode really does the allow listing, a very powerful feature of TE. So let me uh, discuss this uh, quickly. And so when you look at, I can't go into everything about TE today, but basically there are many runtime options that you can specify. And so there's really hundreds or even thousands of different ways you can configure this tool. Um, but the good thing about this tool with this, uh, when you use a lot of these runtime policies and then you use this TE on activates those policies on the system, the good thing is that you can use it in a detection mode only in which the TE tool will not prevent an execution of anything. You just use it to monitor the system to find executables that have maybe some type of problem, error, or, or you can also detect things that are new to your environment that maybe, you know, somebody, uh, uh, is running a script that is not known to anybody, and that could actually be a bad thing. So you can use it to detect off, uh, unauthorized executables, uh, but you can also use it, depending upon how you configure the uh, the policies, you can use it to prevent execution of an executable as well. Okay, so this is an example. I won't go through all of these options, but uh, for example, let's say we use this uh, TE equals on, and the week, then we... Uh, you know, match it with some of these other runtime policies. And so let's let's look at the upper left combination. 
if you say T E equals on and you do check exec equals on, basically all it's going to do is do the checking of executables. Um, so that when anytime an executable execute, there's going to be a check behind it. And what that means is that if the executable does not conform to the database, if that executable is registered to the database and it does not conform to the database, you'll get an error. But also if, if and an executable in this case would be typically like a binary program that executes. Okay. The other thing is that like, let's say you execute an executable, but it's not in the database, then the check exec policy is going to detect that and say, hey, you have an executable that's executing that is not in the database. Uh, in this case, you know, it's not going to prevent anything. However, the other options on the on the top uh, middle uh, and top left stop on untrusted on. Let's say we do check exec equals on, and then we also activate stop untrusted. What that means is that the kernel will prevent any kind of executable, and this would be a, this is a file executable type. If it's not registered in the database, it gets stopped by the kernel. Okay, so this is a preventative feature. And of course, you don't have to use it, but it's just an option. And the other thing here is another type of option combination that you can use in addition is the stop on check fail uh, on option. And what that means is that when in this case, if we have activated check exec equals on, when executable executes, that if that file gets checked against the database, if if that file does not conform to those attributes as defined in the database, that executable is halted by the kernel. Okay. Uh, and then once again, let me just uh, before I go on, the good thing about TE is that you have flexibility on what you check. Like you have it's very granular. So, so for example, you can uh, you can there's four types of file types. There's executables, shared libraries, a kernel extensions, and also scripts. And so you can decide what type of checking to do for what type of file. Okay, so it's very granular and there's you have a lot of options. Now there's an other, here's another mode of, of using TE, which is actually very powerful and I actually know personally of power customers that use this, uh, very important to them. And this is the TEP, trust the execution path. And when you, this is a completely different runtime mode, separate from what we've been talking about. And when you activate this, essentially what you're doing, you're activating a path. It's called the trusted execution path, which is a, a list of directories. And any file that executes, basically it must, if it's an executable or script, it must reside in one of those directories in order to execute. So this is another form of allow listing, okay, that is using a trusted execution path that restricts what executables run on the system. This is a very powerful measure that you can do. And the value here is that why would you do this? The reason why is that this limits what uh, what executables, where they can run out of. And the idea here is that if a hacker gets on your system, typically, if a hacker gets on your system, one of the things they do is they do reconnaissance to, and they do reconnaissance to reconnaissance on the local system, but all, also on the local network, they could be uh, uh, retrieving hacking tools that they run. And so any kind of tool or script that is foreign to the system, we want to be able to control that, to prevent that or detect that. And so that's why you would want to control what executes off your system. And this is a way to limit what directories uh, provide access for executables to run out of. Okay, so this, this is a very high security uh, feature that can be used. Okay, so I'm gonna go on and uh, the next uh, section we're gonna cover is the uh, TNC component. So this provides AIX uh, and BIOS patching. You know, this is a very important thing is to provide um, operating sy system patch management. And so it's actually recommended, you know, the Center for Internet Security is, is saying that all types of organizations, whether you are small to the largest with the highest security uh, standards, uh, you should be doing um, patch management, uh, perform automated operating system patch management. So that's, and that's where TNC comes into play. So TNC provides, and it stands for Trusted Network Connect. It, it's a patching solution for AIX and BIOS. For AIX, it allows you to update an AIX VM with new iFixes, AIX service packs or technology levels. There's also another thing that I listed there called open source packages. 
And so these are other install P formatted or RPM formatted packages. A good command example of that would be like the ls off command. So the ls off command is a networking admin tool. And that tool you cannot uh, install from AIX Media. In order to install that tool, actually, you would download it from a, a internet site and install it on AIX as an RPM. And so that type of tool that is, you know, it's a it's a third party or it's it's not a first party IBM tool that's part of the AIX media. Um, uh, we qualify that and categorize that as an open source package. Uh, so that provides, uh, you know, the ability to include some of those uh, non AIX uh, media uh, installable elements. Now for BIOS, all it does, it doesn't do uh, service packs or technology level uh, changes. All it does is iFixes, but you could also define one of these open source packages that you can install on BIOS as well. It provides, provides also the ability to check partitions according to a policy. And so what that means is that you can define a patch policy and that patch policy sets the criteria that, that you want to require for our partition to meet in order to be considered as patch compliant. And if this is very powerful and very flexible, so you can have, you know, if your production environment has different technology levels, no problem. We can, you know, a policy can have different criteria for different technology levels, and you can combine that all together, and you will have no problem with uh, verifying your systems. Uh, TNC automatically downloads updates. So one of the philosophies behind TNC is that we don't want customers having to download anything themselves. We want to download like all of these iFixes and service packs automatically. Uh, so the customer never has to intervene to do that. NIM is the under, underlying uh, uh, solution that deploys this. So you have NIM server client um, deployments that actually deploy these uh, updates. This is a TNC topology diagram that basically illustrates everything. And what we have here is a TNC PM is contacting the internet. It's working either through a direct connection via a firewall exception, or it's using a HTTPS proxy. Uh, and the TNC PM component is, is basically a NIM server that is using SUMA and curl to retrieve iFixes and service packs, service packs from the internet. And then what occurs is that daemon on the TNC PM is also basically interacting with a NIM server. NIM, uh, NIM server client relationship is used to deploy this on your AIX or VIOS system. Uh, there's another thing, another component that's called the TNC server. That's another daemon. That's the main control point that basically issues the commands to update uh, partitions. It also issues a command to verify endpoints. Uh, it also, the, the TNC server, once you deploy TNC, and this has to be first all done at the AIX level, VIOS level, at the command line level, once you deploy your infrastructure, then you can have the TNC server uh, interface with the Power SE GUI server so that uh, some of the functions that you do at the command line layer, you can do at the GUI. The most important functions can be done via the GUI server, the Power SE GUI server. Um, so basically in the topology, you know, you have that TNC client. This is a daemon that's on AIX and VLS. Uh, basically it, uh, it is the endpoint that receives all of these updates. The TNC server I said is the main control point of the, of the solution. It actually controls everything. TNC never automatically updates endpoints. Okay. So you, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, everything is controlled explicitly via TNC server commands. Uh, TNC PM is the patch uh, repository server. It's basically a NIM server that's automatically pulling everything down from uh, the internet, your iFixes and service, pa uh, service packs. Okay, so before I continue to our last section on EDR, I'm going to talk about some 10 key features of uh, TNC. One of the good things is that it integrates with the GUI, so you can use point and click functionality of the GUI to easily uh, check and update uh, systems and also you can do some other GUI functions such as uh, define patch policies in the GUI. It automatically retrieves uh, the updates, so uh, it minimizes a uh, human effort by automating the uh, uh, the retrieval of all updates. Uh, you have complete flexibility in defining your patch policies, uh, so it's a highly granular solution that allows you to define patch policy any way you want. And also, you can do what's called the default policy in TNC, and the default policy is a thing where you basically have the system, the TNC, determine whether or not uh, a system is properly updated. And uh, that's another form of managing your systems, and it's actually useful. It's, it's, a, it's a really good tool, but there are some caveats to it. 
but it is a really great uh, mode of operation that you can use as well. Automatic fix correlation with service pack. So one thing, you know, when you're dealing with iFixes, an iFix doesn't uh, typically cross more than one service packet. You can only typically only use an iFix with one service pack. So you have to really manage that correlation of service packs and iFix iFixes uh, if you're not using TNC. But with TNC, it handles all of that complexity for you, so you don't have to manage that whatsoever. Um, uh, you know, anytime it runs a check on something or recommends, it's actually looking. So what's what happens when you do a, a, a verify operation against an endpoint, you're inventorying your system. So all of the re recommendations that TNC will provide for patching are based upon what's actually installed on your system. Um, extensive RPM and install P format. So if you have other like RPMs, as I said, like LS off, that's on the Internet, you can actually define that as an open package and uh, deploy it to your AIX or VIOS systems as an open package, even though it's not a standard, you know, um, install P formatted or RPM uh, that's found in AIX medium. Uh, lightweight, so the code base is very small for this, so that means it's fast, it's, it's uh, excellent performance-wise, uh, it's a small code base, it's specialized for AIX, so the code base is small and very efficient and fast. Uh, you can fully automate the entire solution because it's a command line based solution, so you can actually fully, fully automate configuration and, and install very uh, somewhat easily. Uh, handles, so there's a, a concept in iFixes, and so, so what happens, there's a security problem and iFix is published, but sometimes they have to update that iFix with a newer version, right? And so you can have superseding versions of iFixes. It handles all of that. So let's say you put an iFix out for a problem and then a new iFix is, is, is published. TNC will automatically download that and TNC is smart enough to issue an error saying, hey, you know, your iFix is actually outdated. You need to redeploy this iFix because it's a newer version. So it handles that nuance of iFixes. And then very importantly, also you can deploy iFixes, service packs and tech technology uh, levels using alt disk. Uh, so that's a very useful administrative feature that's very popular with customers. Okay, so last but not least is I'm going to uh, spend, the last section is talking about endpoint detection and response. So this is uh, the new functionality that really released in PowerC 2.0. So why is this important? And you could see here the Center for Internet Security uh, is saying that there are a lot of things with respect to EDR that are important from a cybersecurity context. And what they're saying is for, and these are more, so these are IG level two and IG level three things, right? So, uh, uh, so four of these are really for all, pretty much most all power customers, but two of these recommendations correlate to IG three, which is a very high security level. And I would say the majority of customers aren't really IG three. They're more of a IG level two type of uh, organization. <clears throat> So, uh, so anyway, they're saying uh, basically you should centralize audit logs. You should conduct audit log reviews, and that's something that new. There's a new tool in PowerSE that actually facilitates that in a wonderful way. Uh, they also say that you should collect uh, provider logs, and if you look at it, it, it says uh, example Im implementations include collecting authentication and authorization events, and that's actually a particular specific thing that PowerSE does. Uh, so that's good that PowerSE is doing that. Uh, CIS recommends that you should centralize secure security event alerting, and that's definitely what this uh, PowerSE GUI and the agents can do. Uh, you know, CIS recommends deploying host-based intrusion uh, and detection detection and prevention software, and uh, that is found in a lot of the PowerSE functionality as well. Okay, so this term could be a new term uh, for you, and so what is this? What does this term mean? This is a definition from uh, Techopedia. Basically, EDR is a specific type of security focusing on endpoint devices. It is often described as the use of a central data repository to observe and analyze endpoint vulnerabilities and work towards a stronger endpoint threat response. So the key part of that sentence is central data repository uh, to analyze vulnerability and security event information. And that's exactly what the GUI is kind of designed around. It's you have a centralized GUI that's communicating with those endpoints, it's receiving all of these security event information. And so, it, you know, PowerSC is well adept and, and just historically, it's actually a great 
um, solution for doing EDR. It's fundamentally very conducive for providing EDR functionality. So this is this uh, slide provides more detail as to what exactly EDR is. So EDR revolves around philosophy of endpoint security that by securing and locking down systems, and that's what we're doing, we're locking down those VMs, security professionals and other stakeholders can get effective protection against hackers and malware operators. And so, yeah, there's a huge emphasis on malware, uh, what's being done with the allow listing. Uh, endpoint detection response helps to achieve this goal by creating a structure and framework for vulnerability handling handling at that point. And so that's what PowerSC is doing. You see, what, what's occurring is that as all of these logs and event information is coming to the, the UI server, it's structuring that data so that it can be analyzed later. And also so that you can uh, take that data and have alerts defined. Uh, and it's really great because the EDR functionality of PowerSC allows you also to to define this very granular and also at a host level on a VM level so, for example, let's say you have 100 VMs, but one of them is like the most important. What you can do is actually implement the security detection of that one VM completely different from all your other VMs to where you can be much more sensitive about security events on that one critical VM that has a very important application. But on the other VMs, since the security criticality maybe is not as great, what you can do is lower the security event information. Uh, so. <clears throat> So, so all of, basically EDR platform on piracy is enabling, enabling all of this and much in line with the philosophy of what EDR should represent. So some security professionals compare it to advanced threat protection in terms of the models that are used. Endpoint detection response may be opposed of both tools and capabilities. And so, uh, so the thing about PowerSC is that PowerSC is basically talking to the tools that are natively deployed on your endpoints. Okay, so that really falls in line with what EDA, uh, EDR should be doing. Um, okay, endpoint detection response is often used in the context of cybersecurity. Okay, so uh, I have a diagram matrix that kind of illustrates everything. And what I have here is that these are, there's many different aspects and categories to uh, EDR functionality. And so one category is log inspection. And what I'm listing out there is all the files that, that are involved with log inspection. And I indicate what operating system they correspond to. Another thing, part of EDR is what's called vulnerability assessment scanning. And that's actually done via the security and compliance automation tool. Uh, intrusion detection prevention as, uh, you know, that's uh, done via uh, the support scan detector. And and actually, I should have listed as well, um, uh, real-time compliance as a form of intrusion detection as well, because uh, real-time compliance is, is actually monitoring the most important security files of the AIX operating system. So it's actually intrusion detection as well. Allowed listing is done via this new uh, component of, of RHEL for PowerSC called File Access Policy Daemon and the AIX Trusted Execution. So you have FIM, uh, as we've discussed, patch management. <clears throat> so patch management on, on SLES and RHEL, basically, it doesn't, there's no native solution for, uh, for RHEL or, or SLES, but what PowerSC can do is interface with YUM and it also on RHEL, and it can interface with Zipper on SLES. So if you are using YUM and Zipper already on RHEL and SLES, then uh, basically the GUI can interface and you can run a check or update via the GUI, but it's talking to the underlying configuration of YUM or Zipper on the Linux host. And then also, you know, all of these messages, uh, PowerSC is well adapted to forward uh, messages to a SIN. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's different, when you configure the tooling, there's different types of event types that you can define. And so I've listed, listed all of the event types and how they correspond to operating systems. There's also security events, like for example, too many password failures. That's a specific event type that's being detected. And if, if that occurs, you can have various actions occur. And let me show you what this looks like on the GUI. So you have all of these event types and for and this is on a host basis so we're looking at and the configuration of just one vm and for one vm you can specify for different types of security events i want to classify it as a tippet as a, a certain type of urgency and how to respond whether i want to respond via email or syslog uh, so it's very granular very powerful 
And then this is the tool that allows us to analyze all the events. And so under the reports tab in the GUI, you're able to basically filter all of these events according to the urgency that you've configured for these events. You can uh, list a category, you can use timestamps, and you can also use the uh, uh, filter by text uh, attribute. There's also hidden alerts. What that means is that sometimes when you're when you're looking at alerts, you archive them. And so they uh, in Power SE, we call that hidden. Basically, it's like an archive operation. You can even bring back the visibility of archived alerts as well if you're analyzing for intrusion on your systems. Okay, so we're about finished. I just want to cover, uh, discuss a few services that I provide via lab services. Uh, so these are the services that I provide. Uh, basically, a very popular service is AI Security Assessment for CI 7.1. That's a very comprehensive service uh, that we provide in uh, analyzing a VM and giving you recommendations. It's also a good way to start talking about improving your AI security. We provide a very similar service for that that's based upon CIS benchmarks called the Linux Security Assessment, and we can provide that for Intel or Power, uh, and we provide that for RHEL, SLES, and Ubuntu. Uh, we also provide, if you're uh, wanting to check out Power SE, I provide consulting services for security and compliance with Power SE, and what that basically is, is basically deploying the EDR functionality, the UI agents, the UI server, uh, configuring RTC, configuring the, the security hardening and helping you with that. We actually have scripting and lab services that we can provide to help you automate that as well. Uh, we also have a separate service for helping customers with the deployment of TNC for AIX and BIOS patch management. Uh, we also provide assistance with helping customers adopt MFA with PowerSC. Uh, if you're interested in, interested in centralizing your passwords and user and group information on uh, MSAD, for example, uh, or maybe IBM Security Directory Server, we have LDAP uh, service as well, services as well for that. Uh, if you want to learn more about the trust execution tool, uh, we provide a service for that. Uh, Role-based access control is another service we provide for, for AIX. And then also, if you want help in uh, configuring AIX auditing on AIX, uh, we provide services for that. We also have some, uh, 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 in the lab services, some container-related uh, security services. Um, if you simply want to uh, assess the operating system that's running your uh, container platform, uh, we have the Linux Secure Assessment for uh, RHEL, SLES, and Ubuntu. But also, we just recently developed a new service, uh, OpenShift Security Assessment. So if you want your uh, OpenShift cluster analyzed according to CIS best practices. Um, uh, C there's a CIS benchmark for available for OpenShift, and we actually use that in order to provide you a report so you can know the status of your security hardening for one of your OpenShift clusters. So the last few uh, diagrams are just references and links. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. I'm happy to arrange a conference call to uh, to discuss your questions. If you're interested to learn more about any of the services provided, I'm happy to, dis to discuss that. And actually, last um, November, December, there was a new uh, ex security accelerator program. So, for example, if you bought like 950 hardware, uh, you actually could get a Power SE service and a security assessment service uh, under a special deal if you bought Power hardware last uh, November or December, if you have the right particular hardware type. So anyway, if you're interested in all of that, please send me an email. I can help you uh, learn more about all that. And I guess I'm done, Joe. Okay, Stephen, um, awesome. Um, I'm gonna throw you, we only have a few minutes left here, so I'm gonna throw a few questions at you that came in. Okay. Um, let's start with a cloud. Uh, there was a question about if somebody goes to the Power Virtual Server Cloud, um, how can they use um, Power SC in that? Is it is it part of the cloud? Do they need to pay for what they have, pay for what they're using in the cloud, or or and you know I'm sure it's limited um, on what what they get, but what can you tell us about it? Well, you have to, uh, this is a licensed product, so you would need to verify that the licensing, if you're using a Power Virtual Cloud a VM, uh, you want to verify that, uh, you know, you first got to establish licensing so that you can run it uh, on that system. Um, uh, and then, you know, if it's an AIX partition or a, a Linux on Power and you have the right level, then yeah, you can use Power SE on those uh, uh, Power VS uh, systems. Okay, so you would license it for the cores that you're using in the cloud then? Yeah, um, yeah. So okay. the cores, so the, yeah, the licensing is based upon cores. So the core, whatever okay. VMs, there has to be a correlation between the core and the VM. Is, and then there were some questions on, um, is the PowerVC 
or uh, Power SC on the endpoints? Is it like one per um, VM, one per system? I know it's licensed per core, so I'm guessing it's really the agents on the, on it, every okay. VM. Yeah, so it's it's a uh, it's really it's a uh, it's a VM based solution now that the licensing you know is tied to core, but but that's the only thing that core is involved with outside of the licensing. Basically, what you're uh, deploying is these solutions on a VM, and so what that means is that you have file sets like. You're going to have a file set for the UI agent that talks to the server. You're going to have a file set for the security and compliance automation. There's an individual file set that you install. So you're so depending, there's a lot of tools here, like we're talking about, but they're basically structured around file sets and RPMs on Linux. Okay, so depending upon what packages you're installing on the VM would uh, translate to what PowerSE tooling you can use on that VM. The Power SE GUI is simply providing a centralized management framework so that you can talk to, you can interact with all of these tools that are installed locally on each VM. And and the endpoint or the the GUI then is just running on one partition in one place. Yes. Then it and it can be on it doesn't have to be its own system. It can just be a partition on another power system somewhere. Yes, correct. It's just a VM running on HTTPS server. Yes. Okay, and, and just to make it make it clear, because there was a question on this, is when you talked about an endpoint, you said 500 endpoints and, you know, up to 1,000. Um, an endpoint would be a VM, then not a, a server. It would not, not, not be a server. physical server. It's really more a VM. So 500 yeah, okay. M VMs, yeah, an endpoint is a VM, uh, yeah, in, in the way okay. I'm using it. <laughs> um, somebody asked if it's okay to run it on an M server. Uh, yes, um, sure. I mean, yeah, you can run the GUI server on the same partition as the NIMP server. Um, you can do it. There's people that do that. From a security, if you want to be really, really picky, it, it's better to separate. So there's a PCI security concept that with VMs, you shouldn't you shouldn't have multiple servers run on the same VM. This is a, a virtualization security recommendation that uh servers should have their own vm and the the rationale behind that is that if a hacker breaks into that vm not only would he potentially be able to attack the power se gui server but he could also attack the nim server and so it's better to separate those on different vms so that uh, a hacker would have to exploit and infiltrate two vms instead of one uh, but on a practical basis, yes, you can do that, but from a security basis, it's more recommended to separate those and not run multiple servers on the same VM. Okay, okay. Um, somebody asked, you were talking about templates um, and pro profiles. Somebody asked, can you create your own profile with your specific rules um, without using one of the defined ones or make it out of one of the defined ones and, and modify it? Absolutely. You can, you have all of these profiles and you can take whatever portion of a, of a profile that you like, and you can create it, put it into a new profile that you name, and then you can take other rules from different profiles. So you can mix and match and do whatever type of custom configuration you want. Okay. I'm no um, just looking through here. Somebody asked, when will EDR functionality be supported on AIX? It's it's currently, okay, it's currently, a, this EDR is, it's available for all the platforms. So let me go back. Um, um, so what you see, what you're doing here is for all of the, now, some of these, like, if you, if you take a look at, at some of my prior, um, <clears throat> prior, uh, uh, slides is that uh, the EDR, so what the EDR doing is doing, it's collecting all of this information at the UI server and then it's it's categorizing it and it allows you to use a, 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 the separate uh, report analysis tool to dig into the events. And so so you can benefit already right now, AIX, REL, CELES, and IBMI, there's already, it's already providing EDR, EDR coverage already in this release. And so, uh, so that's already there because the, um, that's already been done. 
Uh, now, over time, like they will provide EDR is a very uh, there's a lot of functionality that uh, that corresponds to EDR. So what you're going to see is in future releases, I, I anticipate uh, Rocket Software to add even more and more EDR related functionality and to make it a more comprehensive EDR solution. But already it's doing some incredible things as far as EDR functionality uh, you know, is concerned for okay. all of the operating systems. Good, good. Um, so, I mean, there are some other questions here. We're kind of out of time then, so I'll, I'll capture the questions and we'll see what, what we can do with them. But um, I just want to say um, thank you very much, Stephen. I really appreciate this. It's been great. Uh, security is just such a big deal these days, and, and I think, you know, we probably don't hear a, a fraction of what companies deal with as far as breaches and issues that they have. Um, and, yeah. and every company is worried about it because of the costs, um, which are just amazing um, about this. Mm -hmm. So it definitely pays to um, take precautions. Power SC is a fantastic part of uh, what IBM offers to do that. So I really appreciate you telling us about it. My pleasure. Um, My pleasure. And uh, everybody, thank you very much for joining. And um, I'll be getting out in the next week or so. Uh, some invites for next month's topic, which I'm still working on. So um, everybody have a good month, and um, see you all next month. Bye. Thank you.